Hello there, all you beautiful fellow hominids, and welcome back to another episode of Anecologist Plays Ancestors, the Humankind Odyssey. Now grab your coffee, grab your bananas, and let's head right into it, because we are discovering a new little spot here somewhere. And this spot in the cave system would be the Hidden Pit. So we're in the woodlands again. Last time we came down here, we had a look at the entomopathogenic fungus, and we'll have a brief look at them on the way out again. I was also attacked by a giant centipede, the Scolopendra species, that's why well, there was one in this uh, cave network. And I have quickly come back, I have killed it, and just had a look to see what was on the other side, because you know, chickens cross roads, ominous go through caves. So we are at the hidden pit over here, quite nice. We also have, hanging from the ceiling here, a whole bunch of these glowworms. So they ended up not really being worms, of course. Um, so they are a type of fungus gnat. Now, a fungus, fungus gnats usually feed on fungi. Uh, however, this group of fungus gnats are found only in New Zealand and Tasmania, and I think in Australia as well, so in the Australasian region. And they produce these silken threads, very similar to you know spider silk, but not produced in the same way. And they hang it from the ceiling over there, and then they produce a bioluminescent reaction, resulting in it glowing. Now, the whole idea of that is to attract moths and other insects flying around here. So they get attracted by these lures, they fly into it, they get stuck, and then the glowworms, which will be at the top there, the little fungus gnat larvae, will be reeling these up quite quickly. Of course, the more they struggle, the more they get entangled, and then as they get to the top, they are then eaten by the larvae of the fungus gnats. So that's quite cool. Uh, of course, sometimes, you know, there's not a lot of food in caves like these, and it has been known, or they have been known to be cannibalistic in those times as well. So when other things aren't available, I guess fungus gnat larvae is back on the menu, boys. So quite an interesting group. And also this little entomopathogenic fungus here, the Isaria, you can see the fungus bursting forth from these moths. These moths appear to be some kind of emperor moth or something along those lines. And you can see some eye spots on the wings there. Now, eye spots like those are usually on the hind wings. In this example here, it's actually on the, on the front wings of the moth. However, usually it's on the hind wings and it's supposed to be some kind of startling behavior where when they have their wings folded like they would technically have here, the eye spots are actually covered by the front wings and when they feel threatened, they quickly flick open their wings and it looks as though a pair of eyes are looking at you. So that is a, that's a quite a nice defense mechanism. Sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. However, in this case, they've been attacked by this entomopathogenic fungus, the Isaria genus, or in the Isaria genus. And we are going to just quickly try and eat this fungus. Our objective today is to become omnivorous. We want to be able to you know, eat everything we possibly can. And one of the things we have to do in order to get to, to that stage is to eat a whole bunch of fungi, drink some water to feel better, and then repeat the process until we are we have matured the neuron responsible for the uh, ability to eat and digest fungi. So that is our objective today. Just quickly going to do that. And there we go. We apparently have matured that neuron, which means we don't have to eat that fungus anymore. We can leave it alone. Apparently not good eating, so we're just going to ignore the one that we had picked, just in case. And we are going to head back through the caves. And I'll see you again in a moment. Oh my word. Okay, so we were just eating from this carcass. And a whole pack of hyenas decided to come and attack us. They're not supposed to be able to get in here. That was really, really unexpected. We just, you know, casually minding our own business. And then he just decides that this is a good spot to ambush them. Now, of course, smaller animals, not hyenas really, but smaller animals are able to make their way into caves and then get trapped in there. Uh, at Oatsorn, which is where I grew up in many, many, many years ago, uh, there's the cave network, the Kango Caves, which is an amazing spot. If you ever have the opportunity to go there, really, really worthwhile. Now, my dad, had, a few years ago, had the opportunity to actually head into the deeper areas of the Kango Caves, where people generally don't go. He had, was part of a survey that went in there. And in that deeper section, there is a bat that is well, was trapped there many years ago. And there's a stalagmite, I believe, forming around it already. And then also there's a genet, a smaller type of predator, that also somehow found a way into the cave 
and then couldn't find its way out again. Now, like we currently can't find our way out of this cave network. So we're just going to have a look around. We'll see. Of course, big animals like the Ahina there that was trying to get to us. Really not a high chance of it randomly popping up in a cave system, but there is always the opportunity that, always the chance that it could happen. Okay, we finally find our way out of the cave system. And where we are heading is, well, we are going to go to our settlement finally again. But there are also three little air landmarks that we hadn't, haven't discovered yet. So we might as well go for them uh, because we are going to need all the neuronal energy we can possibly get. Uh, so we're going to go there first to discover them and we'll be back in a moment. So we are at the first of the landmarks. This is the Around the Tree Oasis and it seems to be around one of the mango trees. However, on the other side, right over there, we make our way there, there's a new tree for us. And this tree I have often seen growing along rivers, mostly in savannah ecosystems rather than in these types of greener, wetter woodlands. Of course, uh, just because I've seen it in one area doesn't mean it can't be in another. Now, there are uh, quite some big fruits hanging around there. And this is a very, very characteristic species that we are going to be looking at now. One of my all-time favorites, along with the marula, one of my all-time favorites. Also quite characteristic bark that it has. You know, not the woof woof kind of bark, but the type of bark you find around trees. And there are the fruits hanging over there. We can see white, large fruits. And they kind of look like sausages. So this is a sausage tree. <laughs> Agelia africana. So let us just quickly inspect it here while we are up in the canopy of the tree. New type of food. Wonderful. I was wondering when, when we are going to actually encounter this. Now, the leaves aren't quite right for a Kaigelia, but anyway, uh, we are here. We are finally eating some sausage tree fruit. Now, sausage tree fruits are actually extremely hard. Very, very tough. You can't just go and bite into it like this. You are going to break your teeth. However, large animals like hippos, rhinos and elephants, they would be able to eat it because they've got, you know, firstly, they can step on it, break it open a little bit, but also very, very tough dentition and mouths and everything that possibly needed to go and eat this. So these are true fruits where the seeds are dispersed by some large mammals, not by hominids like in this case and not by birds. Way too tough fruit to be dispersed by those small animals. Okay, let's just grab our stick again. We are always in dangerous territory. We were just attacked by hyenas down in the caves. So yeah, might as well just keep our eyes open and eyes peeled see if we can still see anything else that's dangerous. Now, we are just going to go to those two landmarks. We're going to run around the corner here and hopefully we'll get there. And on the way there, we are basically going to eat every single egg we can. Try to get our hominid used to eating eggs and acclimatized to that. The neuronal pathway strengthened for that, for eating eggs and digesting eggs. And then, of course, assimilating nutrients from eggs. Because we are now able to eat mammal meat without problems. We're able to eat... Uh, reptiles and birds and we're able to eat everything else we haven't been, we're not able to eat eggs yet so that is on the agenda today now in this area in this cave system where we are trying to discover this there is an amphimacaridus which is right up here we are probably going to have to scare him away in a moment just so that we can conquer our fear eventually and once we have been able to scare him away and conquer our fears. We should then be able to discover this spot. Another little short cave, a little passage between two areas. The covered gorge. Seems like there's a whole bunch of skeletons over here. Not sure what the idea of that is. Whether that is supposed to represent some kind of butchering site of hominids or whatever. But anyway, there it is. And that leaves us with this one last landmark that we haven't discovered around here. There we go, the last landmark that's on our journey today, the Rocky Pass. So just on the other side of the covered gorge, we have the Rocky Pass. There's the Amphimacaridus. I think he's coming back to us. <laughs> it's making his way back towards us. Now, the fun thing about the fact that we can now assimilate nutrients from fungi is that there are some fungi around here, and we can eat it without any negative consequences. So, 
just watching that I'm from a car this. Here we are. We can now eat this and no problems. And we have assimilated nutrients from the Eumycota, which is the fungus kind of food. So yay! One step closer to being omnivorous. Next up, eggs. After this. <laughs> I'll go away. <laughs> right, we are heading off. We are going towards our settlement, which is way in the distance. And on the way there, I'm going to eat every single egg I possibly can. I'll see you in a moment. And some great news, everybody. We have just matured the neuron that will allow us to eat eggs. So this one, unfortunately, will probably still make us sick. There we go. But we are so used to eating eggs that it's actually extremely quick to not get sick from eating eggs. So, as soon as we make a sleep spot, we will be able to mature that neuron. And then we'll be able to actually become an omnivore. Okay, so just to show you the neuronal pathway, after you've done all of this to be able to eat and do kinds of things with uh, all different kinds of food, we now are able to get uh, mushrooms and eat that without any consequences. We can eat eggs without any problems. We can eat oviparous meat, so that's snakes and birds, without any problems. And we can eat mammal food, mammal meat, without any problems. And if you get all of that, you can potentially get the omnivorous bait. Now... I'm not sure whether we have enough neuronal energy. Hopefully we do, and oh, we don't. So we're going to have to do a few things until then. So we are getting close, but we need all the neuronal energy we can possibly get. So I'll be back in a bit. Hey, now we are back at our settlement, and there's some exciting news. Not only the fact that we are going to become omnivorous in a moment, but also because there has been a very exciting article published on the instilling a conservation ethos in uh, people using games like for example like we're playing now and uh, getting people to learn more about nature and become more interested in nature and overall just caring more about nature as well and so for that article there was also a bit of an interview done with me but you can read it in the link below so i'll link the article down below have a look at that really an awesome article and so that article really summarizes the value of games and instilling conservation, uh, you know, feelings and ethos in people uh, you're using games. Not like for not only for example things like Ancestors here, but also Sim Safari, which you can view on the channel, uh, which really kickstarted this channel of mine as well. And I started with Subnautica, moved on to Sim Safari for a bit, and that I think has been by far the most popular videos thus far. I mean, we all feel a little bit nostalgic. A lot of us have played some Safari back in the day and well, it definitely shows. So have a look at the article below, read it, enjoy and uh, yeah, we are going to now quickly become omnivorous. So if we go into our evolution here and we look down here, that neuronal pathway is now and we are full of neuronal energy so, so we should now be able to make it, hopefully. Oh, we're getting close, we're getting close and... Yes, we are omnivorous. Oh, exciting. Now we can eat whatever we want. This is now truly an all-you-can-eat buffet. Now we have to do a quick uh, generation leap now because we have got all the babies with us. We've got 12 reinforcement points. Four of them are going just towards ensuring that we, our next generation stays omnivorous. Now we're just going to quickly do that and I'll be back in a moment. So we have done our generation leap and uh, now it is time to quickly do an evolution leap. So we have 12 individuals with uh, genetic, genetic mutations. So it is now time for us to evolve and we are currently Ardipithecus ramidus. Let's see we whether we can get to the next species, which will be Australopithecus afarensis, the southern ape from afar. So three, we have reached 3.8 million years ago, and there we go. The next species, Australopithecus afarensis. So afar being an area in Ethiopia where the majority of the specimens of this species has been found, or have been found. And then Australo, referring to southern, Pithecus being ape, so the southern ape from afar. And uh, yeah, this is quite cool. So we are now the next species, and the most famous example of that would be Lucy. 
And the good thing about us being you know, Australopithecus afarensis now, we are able to deal with extreme temperatures better. And this will allow us to go into the desert environment now a little bit better. So, that's where we're heading now. As we are evolving here, thank you again for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode and you want to see more like this, please subscribe to the channel. Please click on the notification bell there so that you can be notified whenever a new video is uploaded. And remember, we are here to educate through entertainment. Uh, this is An Ecologist Plays. Thank you very much for tuning in, everybody. Stay safe, and I will see you guys again next week.